Tassa Bago Ato Arahato Samma Sindhu Dasa Namo Tassa Bago Ato Arahato Samma Sindhu Dasa Namo Tassa Bago Ato Arahato Samma Sindhu Dasa Udang Dhammang Sangang Namasami People can continue to sit and meditate as you will. In our tradition, it's considered one and the same to sit or listen to a talk. And what you just heard was a traditional invitation to a Dhamma talk. And then we begin any talk and teaching with a homage to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, uh, the teacher, the potential for awakening, which is the Buddha, the Dhamma, which is the teaching conventionally or truth, and then Sangha, the uh, enlightened beings. What happens when that potential for clear seeing knows truth embodied in a human? And while it's a beautiful place to start a teaching, where we'll begin this talk is in a very different place. There's a figure named Mara in the suttas. Who here has heard of Mara? Yeah, OK, all of us, most of us. So I was speaking to a practitioner in autumn, and he he said, look, I really want to talk to you about Mara because I think something's going on and no one talks about Mara. But in the whole Pali canon, in all the Buddhist teachings, you really have two main characters. You have the Buddha and then mentioned not quite as much, but certainly second most is Mara. This force of death, obstruction, entrapment. Um, and it's strange that we don't speak about Mara more often. And this practitioner said, look, I, I had this experience doing this certain meditative exercise where you see your own face transformed. And I did it for many weeks. And then at the end of it, suddenly, one day, I saw all that was dirty and defiled in me coalesce into an image staring back at me. And it was the most frightening thing I've ever seen. And there was a moment of fear and paralysis. And then the words came to him, I see you, Mara. And the being, uh, the image, looked afraid. And his whole path since then had been predicated on figuring out this concept of Mara and the concept of the escape from Mara. So in the, uh, the initial transmission of Buddhism to the West, uh, the initial translators were all generally resisting or uh, reacting to a uh, Christianity in their home countries, which had become begun to be labeled as superstitious. And so the Buddhism we often get in the West is uh, phrased as a philosophy or a psychology. And there's validity to this. The Buddha, for, first and foremost, taught a method of training our minds and hearts. Um, someone was recently uh, speaking about how he was never able to kind of get into religion. And, um, you know, the hurdle of a binary ad, uh, statement of faith with so many religions can be a large hurdle to pass. And yet for our practice, for the Buddhist path, all we ask is you come and you try to sit with your breath for about 10 minutes and see how that goes. That's what you're asked. And give it a try. Because first and foremost, it's a training of the mind. And so many of the worldviews surrounding it are uh, peripheral. 
or at least not immediately necessary to one's practice. It reminds me of another monk also whose dad resisted saying, I don't like organized religion. And he said, look, there's nothing organized about Thai Buddhism. So the Mara that we get, um, or rather uh, the cosmology which is hidden behind those translations and these sort of more secular articulations is a pretty wild one. We've got a wild cosmology in Buddhism. Christianity has got one level of heaven. We've got about uh, a lot, eight, nine or so, plus the Brahma realms, plus a few different levels of hell. We have a ghost realm and some others. So it's a fun world, um, except it's extremely fraught. And uh, this can be a bit off-putting at first, um, and yet it's uh, important to see that um, I think one of the best articulations, it's a little theoretical, but uh, in the uh, quantum mechanics, there's a wave function, and the act of uh, perception, of looking at something or, or um, measuring a probability field with, at the quantum level collapses the wave function down to actuality. And you can <clears throat> suddenly pinpoint where <clears throat> an elementary particle is and what its spin is, et cetera. But the act of seeing it has a real effect on it. Um, and in a sense, uh, this is Longpur Punadamo's way of speaking about it. What happens is tanha, craving, interacts with a wave function and collapses it down. And this perfect sunyata, perfect emptiness, is fractured into a piece, a parcel of itself. And that's manifestation, the changing, imperfect, manifest world. And if you look at the um, you know, theories behind that first moment of the, the, uh, the Big Bang and what came out of the universe, from a Buddhist point of view, these infinite, <clears throat> as they're phrased, uh, periods of universe expansion and contraction, big bangs and big crunches, are brought into being by the collective tanha, karma, of all beings in that universe. And what this uh, implies is that whatever cosmological landscape we land in, in this Buddhist framework, is a macrocosm, is a wide and colorful depiction of what rests in each of our hearts. So all this to say that one doesn't have to believe in uh, you know, eight or nine heavenly realms, plus some hells, plus the ghost realm, plus the Brahma realms, plus the pure abodes. But what one can notice is that within each of us live all of these realms. We have our days as hungry ghosts with tiny mouths and huge hungry bellies. We have our days as the jealous gods, the asuras, the titans, where we are just angry and wanting to fight all the time. We have our days in the hell realms, uh, battered and wound in on ourselves as we sort of rip ourselves apart. And we have our days as devas, as angels, where the mind is light, refined, and imbued with beautiful qualities. In the suttas, whenever a deva comes and speaks, it speaks in verse, in poetry, always. So within this uh, enormous framework that lives in each of us, there's Mara. And Mara, like Lucifer in the Christian conception, is one of the highest beings. Mara lives in the highest of the sensual heavenly realms. It's ca called Paranimita Wasawati. Uh, the realm of the gods that delight in the creation of others. Or, uh, yes. And this is the apex of the heavenly realms. So there's quite a few realms, and each time you move up a realm, you start with Tawatingsa, which is the realm of the 33, which is almost exactly the same as the Olympian gods. They live on the top of a mountain. Instead of Mount Olympus, it's Mount Sumeru or Seneru. Um, and... Uh, you move up and up and up, and each time things become more refined, and time spans expand. Ajahn Buddha Dasa said, time is the distance between craving and its gratification. 
Time is the distance between craving and its gratification. Those are words worth contemplating more than this uh, few sayings will allow. But what that means is as craving becomes more refined and less time stretches. And also, uh, the gods become more refined as well. I believe in Tusita heaven, uh, which is one of the highest realms. Um, the gods make love, I think, just by holding hands or maybe looking into each other's eyes. Also, uh, apparently devas are very prompt. I think we can learn a lot from how we should act by how the angels act. Apparently, they always are on time, so that's good to know. Also, people that act badly with bad virtue apparently smell really bad to devas, whereas people with good virtue smell very good. So we all have that hopefully going for us. The second highest heavenly central realm is Nimanarati, uh, which is the devas that delight in creating. And basically, they can create whatever they desire. And they work as servants for the highest realm, um, of the heavenly central realms, which is these devas that delight in the creation of others. And what that means is those devas don't actually have to do anything. They just think of something that might be good, and then there it is. And it's strange because all of the realms below them are filled with being struggling and scrambling and living, trying to find gratification for their senses. And then you reach, reach the apex, and a strange irony occurs, where really they're, in some sense, they've reached the apex of what you can expect from the sensual world. And yet they're, in another sense, doomed to a life of supine luxury and uselessness. It reminds me of uh, one teacher who was talking about how people kept thinking they had to get a bathroom attached to their bedroom, as if like the walk down to the bathroom down the hall was too much. And how people sort of thought once they get the toilet like right by the, the bedroom, they only have to walk that far and it will be sort of that much more convenient and this constant chase after convenience and what that really gives us. So here's the apex of convenience and effectively they're zombies in a sense. So that's where we're all heading and if we continue to follow that route. And I know many people have said, you know, middle class existence in the US has a lot of Deva-like qualities the devas are known for being heedless. We're very lucky in the human realm because we suffer, and it reminds us of practice. And in a small corner of this highest of realms lives Mara. He's a rebel prince, apparently. He has his own little thing, and he controls everything below him. And all beings underneath are considered in his sway. And this is how he comes again and again and again into the suttas. He's known we all exist within the realm of Mara. And he constantly balks at those who wish to escape his realm and look to a path that's higher or more noble. And the Buddha equates Mara with a few things. He's metaphorical often, and he's associated with the six sense bases. So eyes, ears, nose, touch, all these realms of gratification we spend our lives trying to satisfy. Um, there's a sutta where the Buddha compares a practitioner to a turtle with its four arms and head and tail, six, like there's six sense bases. And Mara is a jackal waiting right outside. And even as the turtle should sort of pull in all of its limbs and stay inside moist and comfortable. Even so, a practitioner should meditate, keeping all their senses carefully restrained. Because as soon as one goes out and you start to think about the pizza after the sit or the cigarette or whatever, you've poked a, a leg or an arm or a head or a tail out of your shell and the jackal gets it. In another case, the Buddha speaks about Mara as uh, the khandas, khanda Mara. And this is the five aggregates of clinging, those locus of identity we take, the body, the personality, 
as self and identify with it and want to control it. We tie our hearts to it. And when the body becomes sick or our personality isn't as good as we would like it to be or things change, our heart breaks because we have no other refuge. This is Kandamara, it trying to make us attach. There's Kilesamara, which is the defilements. It's those things that constantly try to uh, stop and thwart our growth. Greed, hatred, delusion. There's Machumara of death, the metaphor for all that is ending. And he's known sometimes as the end maker. And then there's Devaputa Mara, which is the actual Mara who's a rebel prince up in a corner of the highest heaven realm. And he's interesting because he will often come right when someone's about to do something very good because he senses that you're on the verge of breaking free. There's a lot of instances in the suttas like this. There's one where Anattapindika, one of the most famous of the uh, disciples of the Buddha, is first leaving the town in, on the night that will meet, let him meet the Buddha. And as he's leaving, this huge wave of fear comes up and he can't move. And then a voice urges him onwards. And it happens three times and then finally he does it and he walks through the gates into the darkness and he meets the Buddha meditating in a grove, and the Buddha teaches him the Dhamma, and he attains stream entry, the first level of awakening. And this is such a common occurrence that when we're on the verge of doing something good, that's when Mara comes. We call it, we have names for it um, in the monastic life, the bow wave of a ship, or Ajahn Yanako calls it entering the mandala. Um, we have someone who just went to a monastery uh, with some intent to ordain, and suddenly out of nowhere, uh, a bunch of issues with the family came up, um, a lawsuit came into being, everything comes out of nowhere. Um, it's very common. Uh, and to know that the better the intention we've set our minds to, the more likely Mara will be to come and resist it. So often you embark on a good action, a good course, and obstacles arise and it can be people can take it as a sign of like uh, I guess this isn't just it's not meant to be if obstacles are coming up on the route to something good you know it's exactly what you should be doing because Mara does not want you to do it so are you making Mara angry that's a good sign if you are and we aren't necessarily talking about a real deity in this case it can really just be the part of you that does not want you to step into an unknown. And we all have Amara in us. Another way, though, that Mara's talked about and how evil thoughts are talked about in the suttas is the Buddha says, evil thoughts invade the mind. And this idea, uh, this same meditator was speaking about a moment of sitting and suddenly feeling this thought come in from outside him, this sort of barb. And what's beautiful is that whenever Mara comes to any bhikkhu, to any practitioner, they don't fight Mara, they don't push him away. They say one phrase again and again, I see you, Mara, I see you. And just seeing Mara is enough. And this idea that, because when we think we have negative thoughts come up, when the anger arises, or the greed, or the doubt, if there's some implicit idea that it's coming up from in us, there's also a deep identification with it, implicitly. If we think of them as really coming as these barbs from Mara, from outside of us, there's a way of not identifying with them. It, it's very powerful, and I've used for months, I've used almost like a mantra, I see you, Mara, I see you. Whenever a negative thought comes, I see you, Mara. And um, 
this is powerful because Mara will strike exactly in the place in your life that's most meaningful, most precious to you. The relationship which has the most potential to be one of love, the one with your wife, with your kid. That's where the anger will come, where the control will come. That's where Mara will try to get you. And to be able to say again and again, I see you and I know exactly what you're doing. And every now and again, you can say like, piss off Mara. <laughs> Like, you don't, you don't always have to be polite about it. Um, and to know this, and this implicit idea that in that phrase, that these are not your thoughts, the idea that we have control over our thoughts and that they're ours is absurd. You don't know what you're going to think next second. How in the world are these under your control? You have the ability to influence them, but acknowledging them as coming up from outside yourself is, is good. I see you, Mara. And when the bhikkhus say that or the bhikkhunis say that, Mara usually sort of sits down looking dejected and sad. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of a little sad, actually. And the next thing is that Mara is, another phrase that comes up in the suttas is one gives Mara an okasa, an opening, an opportunity. You can't give Mara an opportunity. And this is when you compromise your morality, when you do what you know you shouldn't. And a particularly intoxicants seem to allow an opening for whatever you think Mara is, that's where they'll come. And this idea that you need to protect, especially as practitioners, your morality even more carefully. Because it's funny, in the Christian monast uh, sort of monastic jargon, there's this idea that every monastery is being sort of um, uh, under siege by the demons um, because apparently they already control the cities, so they say. But the monasteries and practitioners are the ones that the demons and Mara focus on. So that means that if you give Mara an opportunity, it's all the more dangerous and you have to be all the more careful. And once again, we don't have to be speaking about an external Mara. It's the part in you which does not want you to move into an unknown which it doesn't understand which is the path and that part will fight hard to keep you exactly where you are curled in on yourself in a way it knows there's this beautiful line in a poem i love about sisyphus and it says the immense strength it takes to walk away from a stone you have been pushing forever the last thing you can take from people is their suffering And one of my favorite things about Mara is the idea. We asked Ajahn Anand, my teacher, about him. And Ajahn Anand says, Mara is the part of you which wants prominence, control, and preeminence. And this is where Mara really links to Lucifer, because control is his thing. He rests at the apex of heaven. And what's impressive there is he uses all sorts of tools to control us, our sensual desires, our hatred, our anger. But most of all, he uses pride. And pride touches every one, every single level below. Because every one of those deva realms, every one of those refined levels of happiness is accessible through beautiful acts of giving, of practice, of morality. And yet every one of those realms is also accessible to Mara's tool of pride. And similarly, every one of those beautiful acts is accessible to pride. It is insidious. And Ajahn Anand said this, Mara is the part of you that comes and wants control and recognition. So, you know, you see people come to a monastery and give gifts. And yet if in their heart when they give there's this desire, I want recognition, that's Mara. And I think it's important to turn our minds to this because it's insidious. And it's not like you can't give if that's not in you. We all have plenty of Mara in us and still give, uh, do good things. Acknowledge Mara's gonna be you know, in the sidecar for a while. It's just where we're at. But to see it and to see how that can creep into everything, even our best intentions, and then to go against it. 
This is the secret, is can you bend the stick the other way completely? And when you want to sit at the preeminent table where people will see, or to be seen kind of helping out or doing this or that or giving, can you sit at the very back table? Can you be completely silent? Can the gift you want to give, can you give it to someone else to give for you? I've seen people do that at monasteries. They'll, they'll go, it's such a beautiful act because they'll basically prepare like a cup of tea for some senior teacher and then they'll be about to take it up and then they'll stop and hand it to someone else to give instead. And it's this amazing act. I, I love it when I see it. Um, the opposite is when you like try to swoop in and take the good act, and that's called, I think they call it like pirating someone's merit. <laughs> it's fine, we've all done it. But you know, to see that, to go against that grain and to step out of that game, what does it mean to step out of the game of jostling for position and recognition and status? Because so much of us lives in that realm. It is primal. Uh, in, you know, evolutionarily in the chimpanzee troop, if we lost our stat status as valued members, we were dead, even more so than if we gave up a meal. This is deeper in us than our desire for food to some extent, this desire for recognition. And can you just step out of that game, you know, um, and it, in all of its manifestations, uh, someone was telling me about you know, a coworker had accused her of not uh, sort of following along with a certain email chain, and she'd gotten the archived email and screenshots and a timestamp to sort of send back and like be like, "No, I, I'm actually right." And she just deleted it. And can you delete the email? And then, you know, it's okay to sometimes it can be a big ask to tell no one about these. So you know, maybe if a spiritual friend, you can kind of cheat a little and tell the things you did. That's fine. but in general, can you step out of the game and go against that desire for recognition and turn away from Mara? And it will baffle people. And that's a good thing. And you might find there a hidden majesty you had no idea existed. I remember going to uh, Dhamma Durini and there was a newly ordained uh, or a gone forth seminary uh, a novice bhikkhuni uh, named Satima. And she was, I think she said two sentences the entire time. She used to be a Dhamma teacher and we asked her, you know, what made you ordain? And she said it was just one more step towards disappearing. And she was not invisible at all. She had a majesty around her I have rarely seen and it came from complete silence. So duck low and see once that rage, that sort of raw wound of wanting recognition has had a chance to scream itself out and die down. What quiet majesty of spirit is left to you? And in the Christian tradition, they say, the less well-known you are, the bigger your angel. So good luck with Mara. Good luck with the angels. And uh, we can talk about the other realms another day. Sadhu. Okay, so um, I thought today we could do breakout groups because they're pretty fun. So uh, for those who don't know, what we're going to do, and this works for those of you on Zoom, if you're on YouTube, you can click the Zoom link in the YouTube description. I believe it'll take you to the website and the Zoom link and join us there. But uh, if people want to find about three or four people near you, um, lean towards people you haven't talked to before uh, or talked too much, but it's okay if you just land with someone you know. And um, so group up and spend about, we'll give it about 10 or 12 minutes talking about where Mara is coming for you and what skillful means you've been able to or hope to bring to bear. Where's your Mara and what are you bringing to bear on that Mara? Um, what 
you know, what are some skillful means you've thought of, and just talk with each other for a bit, and then we'll gather together around 10. Okay. So, uh, welcome back. I think we have a chance now. Um, do we have a mindful mic walker? We have, we're, we finally um, got our mic situation a lot better, but we lacked the one cable, which could make it so. So we have one mic, this one. Matt, okay. So if people want to just uh, chime in with um, what came up for them in their groups, what they wanted to share, then we just have some time. And if you're on Zoom, you can raise your electronic hand and we can call on you as well. Uh, we just talked about uh, our, uh, one of our members said uh, something come up to her when she planned this already and something come up that she couldn't come, like when she wanted to come here and, you know, something happened, this and that, and she couldn't come. And then I, it to me, I think, uh, I want to ask Ajahn, what's different between Mara and the past bad karma that 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 the result of the past bad karma in this moment so that's what to ask you know and maybe the same thing or not <laughs> yeah um so the past bad karma um i think if you're looking at the esoteric side of it then yeah, sometimes i think mara could be an opportunity for all that to manifest at once in a particular moment but the thing is, with uh, the Buddha outlined four kinds of karma, dark karma, bright karma, and bright karma is karma to like um, accumulating goodness and happiness of this world. Um, and then both dark and bright karma, which is a mix, which is the cocktail most of us live on. And then neither bright nor dark, which is karma towards the end of karma, karma of the path. And I think is Mara will use all three of those other kinds of kama in the service of his aims. So there's a sutta where uh, Mahamogalana confronts uh, Mara and says, I used to be a Mara in a previous rebirth. And he tried to discourage the Buddha's disciples of that time, a different Buddha in this telling, um, by having the Brahmins throw stones at them. But the Buddha of that time just had them develop loving kindness, and so they we're fine. And so then Mara used a different technique as he, he encouraged the Brahmins to heap praise and wealth on the bhikkhus to corrupt them. And, the, and then the Buddha of that time had the uh, bhikkhus contemplate impermanence and contemplate the body, and so they were okay. Um, and then all the Brahmins went to heaven, so they did fine. But the, the point is, often the tools that Mara will use to keep a person from going forth and pursuing the karma towards the end of karma, neither bright nor dark, is an invitation to bright karma. And he'll say, make merit, do good, enjoy sensual pleasures. What's the use of going forth? So it's just useful to know that sometimes maybe you're about to take a huge step, um, you know, to go visit a monastery for three months and a large windfall of money comes your way or a raise is just what's keeping you from quitting the job is it's just three months away a raise. Sometimes good karma can be in the service of Mara too, because the only karma that really matters in the end is that towards the end of karma. Thank you. I just wanted to, we were talking in our group, and one of the things that came to mind that I wanted to share with everyone was most of the stories, as far as I know anyway, most of the stories in the Pali Canon where Gotama meets Mara are after the awakening. So there's this idea that I think some of us might have sometimes where, oh, you know, if Mara comes, I'm a bad person. If Mara comes, I'm doing it wrong. If Mara comes, my path is a failure. But actually, after the awakening is where Mara and Gotama met the most in the Pali Canon. The difference was he was able to say, I see you. And that is where the change happened.
Yeah, they meet 16 times after his awakening. So it's one of the indicators in the, in the canon, Mara's not a metaphor, just not just a metaphor, because if he was just a metaphor for defilement, the Buddha would never see him, but he's there quite a lot. Good point. Hi. Uh, I have a question about the phrase, I see you, Mara. Um, when I when I started meditating, I just got this idea that um, if I see things clearly, if I'm mindful of things as they're arising, then that'll solve all my problems. And um, and there are certain cases where you know just seeing something, saying "I see you, Mara," sort of resolves the uh, desire. But then there are a lot of cases where you know I I see Mara and I see myself giving into Mara, and now it's just even worse than it was before. You know, uh, and I see my old patterning and conditioning just coming up again and again and I'm just a helpless spectator to the whole unfolding of things uh, yeah I wish I could just say I see you Mara and just keep saying that at least stay in that phase of just keep saying you know till till it ultimately there has to be a resolution I'm not good you know I just don't have the willpower or the resolution to continue saying I see you what do you do in those cases where you just see yourself falling into the same pattern <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, the there's a sutta, the second in the Majjhima Nikaya, called Sabasava Sutta, all the taints, and in it the Buddha describes seven different ways to deal with defilement, and one is by the first is by seeing, but then the next is you know there's using, um, which is where you kind of use requisites or a food or material objects and reflect, I'm using this just for its purpose, just to nourish this body and not get caught up in greed. There's defilements to be abandoned by avoiding them. So like some situations are just too difficult for us to deal with. So you just manage to not get in that situation. You avoid that person. You don't go into the kitchen, you know, when you're hungry, whatever it is. Um, there's defilements to be abandoned by destroying so you know really making an end of them there's ones to be abandoned by enduring just you know kind of keeping your head down not acting on the anger but letting it kind of just boil until it boils itself out so to say yeah this is one useful catch-all but it won't always work you're right sometimes we're not strong enough just to see him and the only person who can always see Mara is the Buddha and the Brahmas um, a way that a divine being will demonstrate mastery over a different divine being is by disappearing because each level is like an increasing higher refined frequency and a higher being can see everything below them but this is how the Buddha demonstrates the superiority to all other beings this will disappear and uh, so all to say that the only one who can always see Mara is the Buddha or the Brahmas but for us, Mara still can disappear from us. We're, we aren't high enough of a frequency of mind to always see him metaphorically and perhaps literally. So, Hi. Um no question, but I just wanted to thank you for repeating the Mara talk. I don't know if you gave it last Wednesday, and I guess it was serendipity, the uh, concept of a bow wave perhaps portending positive decisions was very helpful um, as I try and effect a major sea change in my life. I've been <laughs> creating all kinds of bow waves, and I was getting a bit discouraged. So thank you again for the concept of Mara. I think I'm going to go look at images and try and find a tanka of him just to keep myself on path. So thanks again. Just a comment that uh, I don't know if anyone else can hear it, but it sounds like Mara's knocking at the door right now. <laughs> Uh, 
Hi, thank you. Um, I have a question about the example that you um, that you talked about briefly about, I, I think you said there was someone who was going to ordain, but then many obstacles came up. There was a lawsuit and family troubles. <clears throat> In situations like that, how uh, do you have any words for guidance on how to navigate those obstacles? So for example, how would you um, counsel that person, um, yes, deal with the lawsuit, deal with the obstacles, or ignore them and continue on the path? What, what words of counsel might you have for someone in that situation? those two questions really relate or the comment and the question? Because, um, I, yeah, person whose head I can't see from behind the chair. Um, yes, yeah, you, sorry. <laughs> um, what's your name again? Huh? Tamsi? Tamsi, oh, sorry, okay, sorry. It's hard to see you with the chair. Um, yeah, I, I think this is really common. And I, I've heard someone say that if a big decision doesn't like make about half the people in your life kind of angry and exasperated, it's probably not the right decision. So, um, you know, and uh, one thing I think is important is when Mara is seen, he turns into black smoke and goes this way and that. And how the Buddha deals with him at the seat of enlightenment is he touches the ground as his witness and just sits there. And, and so often you just, Mara is insubstantial and you just have to let blow over often. I think it's why the Buddha says patient endurance is the supreme incinerator of defilement. Because often, like, moments like that, there's something to just keeping your head down and knowing that if your intention, especially is in line with Dhamma, the brightness is, is such powerful comma, it'll pull through. Um, and, and Mara is just black smoke um, to some extent. And to use it as a moment of learning, because, uh, you know, there's a tradition in Bali of putting up these curtains in front of doors because there's this theory that demons travel in straight lines. So if you have a curtain and you have to go around the curtain, the demon can't get in. And uh, my dad once said he thought that maybe traveling in a straight line makes you into a demon. And, you know, there's something to be said for, like, if things are going so well, you get drunk on Mara's realm. The, you know, the, all the worldly winds are at your back. So in some ways, Mara might be trying to keep you from going on the path, but in another sense, if you approach it with right view, it can be a service in the path because you, you see the limits of this realm and it makes all the more clear the reason why we're looking for a realm that's free of lawsuits, you know? <laughs> so so I, I, I've seen, if people just keep touching into Sangha, spend time at monasteries, in Thailand, it's considered your 25th year. You're very likely to die. I think it's called Jiao Jia Pet, right? Yeah, so they'll usually make their sons ordain when they're 25 just to make sure they're safe for that year. So I think if you just keep on taking refuge more and more and dedicating merit, visiting teachers, and making a special effort in your practice, that's how you get over a wave is you put more effort in. So I, I think that's, that's how I'd advise it. I, I've seen this come up so often, like, you know, as a monastic, maybe as a lay person, you weren't attractive to people romantically at all, and then suddenly you decide to ordain, and suddenly, like, you are, and it's, you know, it, it's just out of nowhere, and in some ways, it's Mara trying to keep you, you know, it's, it's very common for that, or a debt to come up, or a lawsuit, or a sickness, so...